Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, before we go ahead and get started, I do need to let you know that uh, we encourage you as you make your travel plans to check out johnnydollarair.com. It's a Priceline affiliate, so you get all the benefits of going through Priceline.com, including being able to name your own price on hotels, rental cars, airline tickets, and more, uh, including cruises. Um, plus, a part of the purchase price goes to support the great detectives of old time radio at no additional cost to you. So when you plan on traveling, remember johnnydollarair.com. Now it's time for today's episode of Yours Truly Johnny Dollar. Uh, we actually have a lost episode between last week's show and this week's, and I'll talk about that after the uh, program. But here now is the uh, Meek Memorial Matter. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Where have you been for the past 20 minutes? In the shower. For 20 minutes? Okay, so I'm a shiny dollar. So you... Oh. Who's that? Max. Max Green at Assured Equity. Oh, hi, Max. What's on your mind? Four score and seven years ago... Our father's brought forth, but that doesn't answer my question. Johnny, you ever hear of the Meeks? Uh... New England family, stood away in the Mayflower, speak only to their money? That's the Meeks. What about them? No, not about them. It's about Mariah Meek and Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. She's lost her copy of it. Well, it shouldn't be hard to find her another one. That's where you're wrong, Johnny. Huh? It would be very hard. Might cost us a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> Bob Bailey, in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Assured Equity and Trust Company, 325 Scott Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Meek Memorial matter. Expense account item one, $1.90, cab from my apartment to Max Green's office. He was standing in a haze of cigar smoke, ashes on his vest, and a worried look on his face. Oh, good morning, good morning, Johnny. Oh, you want a cigar? Oh, no, no, thanks. Let me sit up, sit up. Excuse me. Listen, Johnny... What do you know about that speech that Lincoln made at Gettysburg? Well, I had to memorize it in school, like every other kid. All right. You know how many words are in it? Um, maybe a couple of hundred. Why? Wait a minute. It's in this book. Yeah. It's page 143. Speech is printed here exactly as Mr. Lincoln released it to the newspapers after the Gettysburg Address. You find it? Yeah, but now what okay. do you... Okay. Total number of words, 268. Oh. But the first two drafts of that speech, including the one he read that day... Contained only 266 words. So he padded his part. That's right. Two more words. Mm -hmm. How come? Oh, according to the historians, Lincoln had lived the two additional words at the time he read it. Later on, when he made three new copies of the speech, he included those two words. You with me so far? Keep going, Max. Yes, all right. Right down at the end of it, just before Of the People by the People, where he said that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, hmm? the words under God do not appear in the first two drafts he wrote. Yeah. Well, this is all very interesting, Max, but I still don't see what it is or what it has to do with me. Well, Mariah Meek's copy has disappeared. Oh? And Johnny, that copy happens to contain just 266 words. You mean she owns one of the first two original drafts? Handwritten by Mr. Lincoln himself while he was on the train riding to Gettysburg. Wow. Yeah. Which is, of course, why we insured it for the full amount it cost her. Which is one hundred thousand dollars, even. Of course, you made sure it was authentic before you issued the policy. Oh, policies. naturally. Well, who'd she buy it from? An antique dealer down in Richmond, Virginia, a fellow named uh, Jason Penrod. Uh huh. Well, where's she been keeping it? Under glass in the Meek Memorial. What's that? Well, she collects Americana, so she had a museum built to keep it in, and she calls it the Meek Memorial. Follows. Follows. 
also follows the most expensive item in the collection, the Gettysburg Address, would be the one to disappear. Oh, you're just an old pessimist, Max. You think somebody lifted it? What do you think? It walked out by itself. Okay, okay. So what are you going to do about it? Oh, we're going to run newspaper ads. We're going to offer a $10,000 reward for information leading to its return. If anyone answers it, you let me know where you'll be, and I'll refer them to you. Good. When was it taken? The night before last. Is there any kind of market for something that rare? Uh, it's hard to say, Jolly. A hot camera would be easier to peddle. Sure. But a good many wealthy people, like Mrs. Meek, they make a hobby of collecting things, you know, antiques, objects of art, etchings. But whoever took this or buys it from the thief couldn't just let everybody see it. Well, it wouldn't matter to some people. They take it and put it in a vault and keep it there. Then what's the point in having it around? Pride of possession. You've got something no other collector could own. Mm. And, of course, it might not have really disappeared at all. You're thinking of fraud? A hundred grand is a lot of cash. <laughs> Expense account item two, one dollar and ninety cents, cab fare back to my apartment. I wasn't particularly intrigued by this assignment. Rare documents, like anything else antique, have always seemed to be just one step from decay. And that sometimes goes for the people who collect such things. Item three, sixteen dollars and ten cents, transportation, including a round trip ticket, Hartford to New Bedford, and cab fare to the waiter's hotel. There was a convention in town, so I was lucky to get a room. After checking in, I called the Meek residence. Mrs. Meek was expecting me and said she'd have her car pick me up. I had just put down the phone when someone knocked on the door. You in there? Depends on what you're looking for. I'm looking for Mr. Mr. Jade. Jay, did you say? Nobody by that name here. Oh, yeah. I see. I guess I got the wrong room. Yeah, well, uh, why don't you ask down at the desk? Huh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. That's funny. Where is it? I cracked the door open again. Watched him walk to the stairs. Then I took the elevator down the eight flights to the lobby. Half an hour later, I was in the back seat of the Meek limousine, heading toward the home out on Buzzard's Bay. It was a big, sprawling frame building facing on the beach. About 50 yards behind it, closer to the road, was the Meek Memorial Museum. I was starting up the front steps when the door opened. Mr. Dollar? Ah, that's right. I'm Paul Meek. I understand you have an appointment with my grandmother. Right again. Now come in, please. She's waiting for you upstairs in the sitting room. Okay, thanks. Uh, before you go up, I wonder if I could have a few words with you. Why not? Stay in here, then. You've never met my grandmother, have you? No, no, I haven't had that pleasure. Some people consider it a dubious one, Mr. Dollar. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar, this is my wife, Janice. This is me. Hi. How about a drink? Uh, thanks, not just now. How about you, old stick in the mud? You want another one? After a bit, Janice. And if I were you, I wouldn't have any more. But you're not me, are you? You will have to excuse my wife, Mr. Dollar. She... Well, we've both been under a severe strain since moving here. Grandmother is blind, you know. No, I didn't know. The sight began failing about four years ago. I'm surprised the insurance agent didn't tell you. Well, Mr. Green was so concerned over the theft of the Lincoln manuscript, I, I imagine it slipped his mind. Mm-hmm. And just how do you intend to locate that manuscript? I'm not so sure that I can. It'd be a pity if you could. Be just awful. It's grandmother's prized possession. She hasn't been herself since it was stolen. And being quite elderly, well, we're all very much concerned. Oh, my, yes. We're afraid she might die and leave us all that lovely money. Janice. It's the truth. You see, Paul and I don't have any money of our own, Mr. Dollar. We'll never have any until she does die. Instead of giving it to us now while we're young, you know what she does with it? Spends it, buying junk for that soy old museum. Now, look. That's yeah. gratitude, isn't it? I bathe her, feed her, rub her feet, and do all her dirty work. Janice, and... you've said quite enough. Mr. Dollar isn't interested in our personal problems. Oh, stick in the mud. All right. I'll be in the den if you want me. And that's the funniest thing I've said all day. If you want me... I'm sorry. She doesn't mean half of what she says. Uh, oh, that's Grandmother's signal. Then hadn't we better go up? Yes. Yes, we'd better. We went up the broad staircase, through a hall, and into a bright, sunny room. Wrapped in an old kimono and shawl, Martha Meek sat in an invalid chair, facing the ocean. Paul introduced us, then sat down quietly near the door. 
Paul, I know you're there. Now answer me. Yes, Reynolds. You go on downstairs. I want to talk with Mr. Dollar in private. Whatever you say. And close that door. Don't mind my back, Mr. Dollar. I couldn't see you if I looked into your face. Now then, when are you going to arrest that crook and bring my Lincoln speech back to me? Well, I, I'm i going to need a lot of help and information, Mrs. Meek. Mm-hmm. What kind of information? Mostly about the museum. Like what? Well, do you know who was in there the night the manuscript disappeared? Certainly. That dirty robber was. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, old Pete's always there. Supposed to be guarding the place, but he didn't do a very good job the other night. Got himself slugged. Does he live on the grounds? Yes. I brought him over from Naples ten years ago. He was my guide in Italy. Showed me around so nice, I decided to bring him back. Tell me, is the memorial open to the public? It was going to be. I intended it to be once. That when my eyes... No, Mr. Dollar, I keep it locked most of the time. Uh Uh-huh. And who discovered the manuscript was missing? Pete did, I guess. At least when he recovered, he ran yelling bloody murder up here to the house. Everybody went down to see what had happened. Everybody but me. They left me all to myself. Were there any strangers here in the house that night, Mrs. Meek? Anyone beside the servants and your grandson and his wife? One person, but he's no stranger. Who's that? Jason Penrod from Richmond. He's an art dealer. We were discussing some business. May I, uh... Ask what kind of business? It has nothing to do with you or the people you work for. Sorry. Where can I find Mr. Penrod? He's staying here now. If he isn't in his room, then he's most likely out in the memorial. Now, that's enough questions. You, give me a cigarette. Ma'am? What's the matter? You're deaf? Give me a cigarette before Paul or that snoopy wife of his comes prowling around. (laughs) All right, sure. Light me. Yeah. Ah. Well, you want any more information? Pete's the one to talk to. All right, thanks. But what about your son and daughter-in-law? Were they inside the house at the time of the robbery? You don't suspect them, do you? Right now, I suspect everybody, Mrs. Meek. Even me? Yes, ma'am. Even you. Well, bless you, boy. <laughs> I found Pete Vesuvio trimming the shrubbery just outside the memorial building. He seemed quite willing to talk to me. Uh, How you say what happened to me, mister? I'm uh, hit out? (laughs) Knocked out, Pete. Ah, si, senor. And because of this, I do not see anything. Nothing at all, huh? Please, mister, do not use the insult. I am American citizen, first papers. Because of the kindness of my patron, I will soon be second papers. I know by heart the Constitution, United States, Gettysburg address, pledge allegiance to my flag. You know how I know these things which help me be citizen? Because of my lady, she's letting me work in a place where great papers are for me to read. Because of her, I would not hide anything, mister. Okay, Pete, okay, I'm convinced. But I'm sorry I cannot help you, mister. Well, it's not your fault. Hey, you like to hear me say Gettysburg address. Well, Do it very good. Learn it right from President's own writing. Some other time, Pete. Right now, I have to find Mr. Penrod. Oh, he is inside, mister. Counting the treasures. All of the beautiful things a my lady can no longer see. You'll find him in a Section L, senor. <laughs> I found the small, neat-appearing art dealer just where Pete had said he'd be, peering into a glass case crowded with Derringer pistols. He had a notebook under his arm and seemed to be making some sort of inventory. Oh, oh dear, you you gave me quite a fright, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I uh, wish I could concentrate like that. Well, there's nothing more interesting to me than these fine old pistol things. (laughs) What history they must have, Mr. Uh, Dollar. Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, the insurance investigator. Paul told me you were wondering about the place. I suppose you'd like to ask me some questions, hmm? If you don't mind. Oh, no, goodness, no. I understand you were with Mrs. Meek the night of the robbery. Uh, that is correct, sir. We heard the shouting. We ran out here just as fast as we could. I was the one who discovered the manuscript was missing. You have any idea how the thief got in here? No, sir, no, no. Unless someone forgot to lock the front door, or unless he had a key. 
Well, has Mrs. Meek given out many of the keys? Well, in my opinion, too many. <laughs> Even I have one. What about Paul Meek and his wife? No, I don't think so. Well, they, they really aren't interested in the museum at all, Mr. Dollar. Oh. Yeah. Mr. Penrod, I understand you're quite an authority on antique art and things like that. Well, I... Isn't taking inventory a little beneath your position? Well, I suppose it is, Mr. Dolliver. Uh, last week when I received dear Mariah's wire asking me to do it, I, I simply couldn't refuse it. She's been such a good customer of mine, will she? Yes. You have any idea who might have wanted the Lincoln Manuscript? Well, I know several persons who'd love to have it. He'd give most anything, but I don't know anyone with... The nerve to break in here and take it by force. <laughs> you remember where Paul Meek and his wife were when you heard Pete shouting? They were right in here when I arrived. I see. Well, thanks for... Oh, just one more thing. Oh, yes? If you'd stolen the manuscript... Mr. Dollar... A hypothetical question, Mr. Penrod. But if you had, and you wanted to sell it at a good price with the least danger of being caught, how would you go about it? Well, I, I, I take it abroad, of course. I put it on the open market over there. Huh. You aren't planning on going abroad soon, are you, Mr. Penrod? Oh, gracious, no. <laughs> you know anyone who is? Anyone who, uh... Who well, didn't Paul and Janice tell you? Well, they're flying to Paris Wednesday night. I left the memorial and walked back to the house. The Meeks were in the study, engaged in their favorite pastime. When I told them what the art dealer had said, Paul set down his glass long enough to confirm the fact that they did have reservations and insisted that he had a logical explanation for not having told me of those plans earlier. Very logical explanation, Mr. Dollar. Let me handle this, Janice, please. Sure. Drink, Janice? No, first I want to hear that explanation, if you don't mind, Paul. Of course I don't mind. Janice and me, were fed up. Why didn't you tell me about the plane reservations? Well, why should I have? I'm not even sure I'm going to use them. Oh? Grandmother's upset enough over losing that manuscript. Something else might... Well, anyhow, if the manuscript doesn't turn up within 48 hours, we're canceling our trip. Oh, no, please. Sorry, Janice, but that's the way it's got to be. She did it. What do you mean? It's an act, don't you see? Jason Penrod told her we were going to leave, so she had him hide the manuscript. And now this thing about her being so upset and having such a weak heart. It's an act to keep her precious darling boy tied to her apron strings. I don't believe that. Well, just wait. You will. Anything else, Dollar? What does a trip to Paris cost, Paul? Well, it's not inexpensive. Your wife was complaining about being so broke. Haven't you ever heard of flying now and paying later? We have friends in Paris, Dollar. It won't cost as much to live once we get there. And we'll worry about paying for our ticket when we get back. Any other questions, Mr. Snooper? Yeah. Later. It was after seven when I finally got back to my hotel room. I ordered a drink and tried to make some kind of sense out of the information I'd gathered during the day. But it all added up to zero. I called Hartford and asked Max Green to look into the meek finances. Then I dressed for dinner. I was about to go downstairs when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, I was told to call you. Yeah? It's about the ad. The ad? Tonight's paper about something missing from a certain memorial. Go on. Well, I called Hartford Collect. They said to call you. Yeah, that's right. Who is this? Now, my name's not important, Dollar, but that ten grand reward is. You think you can earn it? You meet me tonight, you'll see. Where? In the alley behind the Bourne Whaling Museum. Be there at 9.30 and be alone. You got it? Yeah, I got it. Expense account item four, 85 cents cab fare from my hotel to the Bourne Whaling Museum. I don't like wandering around dark alleys at night, alone in a strange town. It isn't the best way to stay alive. But at 9.29, I passed the old whaling museum and started down the alley. It was dark, no moon, and it was very quiet. I was about 20 yards in from the street when I saw him, curled up in a ball like he had a stomach ache. Only he didn't. Because somebody had made him very dead. I struck a match and turned him over. I'd only seen him once before, but I didn't have any trouble remembering where it had been. Right after I'd checked in, he'd knocked on my hotel room door. By mistake. At least that's what he'd said. After giving a statement to the local police who identified him, I went back to my hotel. 
Evening, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, say, uh, look, I know it's probably against all your rules, but uh, who had my room just before I checked in? Oh, I couldn't disclose that information, sir. Sorry. Oh, well, so am I. It'd mean a lot for me to know. Maybe even five bucks worth. Well, I... Uh... Well, sir, if it's that important... <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, let's see, uh... Um... Yeah, yes, here it is. Uh, can you read his signature, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, thanks. Just fine. The name I'd seen scrawled on the hotel register wasn't important now. At least not without something more to back it up. There was no law against checking out of a hotel. But there was a law against murder, if it could be proven. And that would be hard to do without finding a motive. So I went back to the Meek house to look for it. I paid off the taxi, that's item five, and started up the front steps. Oh, hi, darling. I thought it might be you. That's so? Mm Mm-hmm. I hope you aren't mad at me for the things I said today. No, no, not at all. I've been a very bad girl. But everything's going to be all right now. It is. Mm Mm-hmm. Or haven't you heard? Heard what? About dear old grandmother. She had a real bad stroke. Isn't expected to live. You, uh, aren't a bit sorry, are you? Would you be, if you were me? Dollar, do you mind coming up here? No, not a bit, Paul. I'm trying to reach you at your hotel. Thank goodness you've come here. Did Janice tell you? Yeah. How is she? Bad. The doctor's given up. Says it's only a matter of hours. Uh, she told me to send for you, Mr. Dollar. Oh? I don't know why. I've never been able to figure out a lot of things she did. All right, where is she? In there. Old Pete's with her, but go on. Thanks. Increased devotion to that cause for which they here gave her the last. Who is it? Oh, it's uh, Mr. Dollar, my lady. Hello, Mrs. Meek. Oh, thank you for coming, Mr. Dollar. I uh, go now. No, wait. Mr. Dollar, you have a moment, haven't you? Of course. I promised Pete the last time I visited the museum. I promised I'd let him recite some of the things he's learned while working there. I haven't been able to keep that promise till now. Go on, Pete. Please. Yes, my lady. They here gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom... And that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you, my lady. Now I I go. Hello, Mr. Dollar. I have a confession to make to you. Yes, I lied to you. Oh, I'm sure it wasn't a very big lie, Mrs. Meek. Oh, but it was. I told you the business Mr. Penrod and I were discussing the night of the burglary. Yes. I told you it had nothing to do with you or the people you work for, remember? Yes, ma'am. Well, that was a lie. I'm broke, Mr. Dalla. All I have left in the world is this house and the things in the memorial. I see, that's why I sent for Jason Penrod. He purchased most of my treasures for me. He's evaluating them now. So Paul and Janice will know what they're worth when they go to sell them. Which they'll do immediately. Mrs. Meek, don't you think you should try to rest now? Will you give me a cigarette? No, ma'am. Sorry. And you must rest. There isn't much else to do, is there? Good night, Mr. Donald. Outside in the hall, Paul and Janice Meek were talking quietly to Jason Penrod. Off in the corner, standing with his back to the others, was Pete Vesuvio. Mr. Dora, is she... She's she... resting quietly. Oh, dear God. Why did you lie to me, Pete? What? I never lied to nobody. Who say I did? I say you did. You're crazy, mister. What lie I tell you? You said you learned the Gettysburg Address right from Mr. Lincoln's own writing in the museum. That's a no lie. What's the matter? You don't believe that, mister. I believe you, Pete. 
But I just had to be sure. Come on, let's join the others, shall we? Let's see. Well, good evening, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Penrod. Tell you any of the family secrets, Johnny? Not too many. You learn anything in there you didn't know before? Yeah. I know which one of you stole the Lincoln manuscript. One of us? Why, you're crazy, Dollar. We were all in the house at the time it happened. That's right. But one of you hired a little man named Leo Jones to do your dirty work. Jones called me earlier this evening. He was going to tell me which one of you it was. Evidently, he didn't like the deal he was getting. What was he doing, Penrod, trying to blackmail you? What are you talking about? I don't know any Leo Jones. Then why did he come around to my hotel room this morning? The same room you just checked out of. Well, that doesn't mean a thing. I imagine several persons have been to that room today. Sure, but they're still alive. Now, let's get to the phony Lincoln manuscript. Phony manuscript? It wasn't phony, Mr. Dollar. Wasn't it? Well, you correct me if I'm wrong, Penrod. After Mrs. Meek purchased one of the first two drafts of Mr. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, she started losing her sight. When she closed the museum to the public, you saw a chance to make yourself another $100,000 sale. So you switched copies of the manuscript, replacing that draft with one containing the words, Under God, which isn't worth anything close to a hundred grand. What do you mean, Dollar? All right, let me quote. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and so on. What? The phrase, under God, was not in the manuscript he sold your grandmother. But it was in the copy old Pete has been studying in the museum. Right, Mr. Penrod? All of you, stay right where you are. You get what Jones got. Mr. Dollar. He won't go far, Pete. But I am the guard. The lady will want me to stop him. Pete, come back here. Keep away from me. Pete! Come on. Oh. You, uh, you tell the lady, I am a better guard now. Much better. See, si, senor. Yes, Pete. I did good. You did fine. Pete Vesuvio will live to apply for a second paper. <laughs> and in time, probably open a spaghetti joint in New Bedford. Penrod will be tried for murder. As yet, he hasn't disclosed the name of the person who purchased the stolen manuscript. But in time, I am sure he will. As for the Meeks, well, Mariah passed on later that night. But as she said, there was nothing left for her but to rest. Expense account total, including hotel and numerous incidentals, $98.30. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
and welcome back. Well, I definitely felt sorry for the poor uh, Mrs. Meek, not only blind, but she had really uh, wanted this to be open to the public to enjoy, and it uh, was going to get sold off. Uh, I like the story, the whole historical clue. It was something I really expected to pay off. Um, and so I kept listening for what word Lincoln had, uh, you know, inserted, and it was when the... Uh, uh, when the caretaker read that, uh, text, uh, that you, that you knew that something was up with the, uh, manuscript and that there, it was not one of the real ones. Kind of had a knack, it reminded me a little bit of, uh, in a small way of national treasure with that history being such a key clue in the story. Um, as I said, there was a missing episode, uh, the uh, Golden Touch matter from February 17th of 1957 uh, was missing. And uh, apparently the, the, the following week, the 24th, the show was preempted. Uh, but uh, I do have to comment on the missing episodes during the Bob Bailey episode uh, era because it's very uncharacteristic of what was going on at CBS at the time. Um, there of the uh, Bob Bailey uh, half-hour episodes over the course of uh, about four uh, seasons, four years, uh, there are 26 episodes missing. Uh, a total of about uh, half a season, so or one of eight episodes. And it's very high, particularly when compared to other series. For example, Suspense ran during the same period, only one episode of Suspense missing, and Gunsmoke ran during the same period, and only one uh, episode of Gunsmoke between 1956 and 1960 is missing. And uh, it continues during the later dollars with 13 episodes featuring Bob Redick and Mandel Kramer being missing. And really, I will say because of that, I am somewhat optimistic that eventually uh, there'll be some episodes found. Because this was the only detective show in action for uh, members of our armed forces overseas. So I have some confidence. I, I you know, most series, if um, if uh, an extra show or so uh, uh, turns up, it's a pleasant surprise. But uh, I really do think that there are more episodes of Bob Bailey and subsequent Johnny Dollars uh, out there and available. I should mention that two uh, Bob Bailey episodes were uncovered by the old time radio uh, researchers, uh, and we and we'll play those when they we get to them. And we have some other um, uh, new discoveries we'll be telling you about in a few weeks with uh, some of the previous Johnny Dollars. But uh, an incredible number of lost episodes currently, so for now, uh, we don't have the Golden Touch matter, um, and we have quite a few uh, episodes missing from this uh, period in the spring of 1957, but uh, we'll uh, carry on. And this one, original air date, was March 3rd of 1957. All right, well, now we turn to listener comments and feedback and have a very good question come in from listener Wes, who emails in and says, I've been listening to your podcast one title at a time. Currently, I'm going through all the episodes of Mr. Moto. And the start of every episode, they make a very deliberate point of calling him Mr. I.A. Moto. Do you know why they felt the need to emphasize these initials this way, especially since the movie Moto had Kentaro as his first name? Well, thanks so much for the question, Wes. Um, in answer, uh, Mr. Moto, before it was a movie, uh, was actually uh, a character in a series of novels by John P. Marquand. And Marquand actually uh, designated the character as Mr. I.A. Moto. And uh, it's uh, somewhat confusing as to why the movies changed the character's first name. But uh, apparently they were doing that just to be true to the books that came prior to the movie. So I hope that answers your question. All right. Well, we'll be back tomorrow with police headquarters. 
Uh, and be sure and listen in again on next Friday when we bring you another episode of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.